We are live. Welcome to the Home Lab Show, episode number 14, Gray Log. And we're talking about Gray Log because logging, it's kind of a problem matic area in open source uh most of the products in this category are not open source in which leads us always to just running a syslog because we're like hey i can set up our syslog and send everything to one server so you do that but that doesn't necessarily you put the log somewhere but it doesn't really solve the problem of doing something with them or creating action items mm -hmm. or making them easy to find so we figured we'd pick this as a topic uh because this is free and open source for you to get going in your system. It is a product that has a commercial backing. So yes, there is a paid version and paid support that can go for people that want to use this in the enterprise as well. So it's got dual purpose, uh, but it's it's going to be a fun topic. And Jay's been looking at it. I've been using it and yep. Jay's been looking at it as a product. So we figured uh, this is a good time to address it. Before we do that with a little housekeeping, um, this video literally is brought to you by Linode. Well, this podcast. And if yep. you're downloaded this podcast, saw you've pulled it off one of the Linode servers that run the homelab.show website. And Jay has been a long time Linode user. And uh, what do you think, Jay? We'll keep going with Linode. <laughs> I think so. I love the interface. I've been using it for, I don't even, maybe it's going on three years now. I always say two, but at some point I have to stop saying two years as I switched everything over. It might even be three or four. I lose track of time. Um, I've been using it ever since that PenguinCon that we went to. Uh, you were there too when they were showing, a, or they had a little stand, and they they gave out the card so you can get a free credit. And I used it, and I'm like, oh, I like it. So literally everything on Learn Linux TV is on Linode. This um, podcast is on there too, as Tom mentioned. And I love their marketplace. They have a lot of one-click apps. Um, they have all kinds of features, node balancers. You can upload your own images now. And another thing I've always liked about them, and even before they had an images feature properly, it was very easily, to, it was very, excuse me, very easy to use DD and just take a local backup of your cloud server, which is awesome. And now you can upload that right up there and spin up a server with a custom image. So they have a lot of great features and I like it quite a bit. Yeah, Ben, Ben, solid platform, a longtime user of Linode myself too, for lots of little projects that I've done on the channel over the years. And, you know, it, it's, it's a good solid system. So we do have an offer code for those of you that would like to get started with Linode. It'll be down in the links below. Also, uh, you can run Greylog in Linode. That's one of the things yeah. me and Jay were talking about is where you run Greylog will be part of this conversation, but it's open source. And there's not any licenses attached to it for the free version. Therefore, you can spin up an instance local and one in Linode. And we'll talk about why that might be a good idea because you really want your log server close to wherever your servers are and wherever your workload is because you do have to get all that data over to where it needs to be. Yep. And if you're lucky enough to have a static IP, they have a firewall feature in L Linode now. So even if you do roll it up, uh, roll it out over there, you can basically make it only accessible by you in your local LAN, even though it's not in your LAN, which gives you the flexibility to control what's local and what's not. Yeah. The reason we're also swing it back to logging and mm -hmm. uh, one of the problems of logs is the promise that every salesperson pitches, the single pane of glass, the single source of truth, where you can learn about what's going on in your stack. This is the promise every logging company makes. And it is, it can be done. It's, there are products out there that do it, but it's also a challenge because you have to ingest all the different log formats and put them all in one place. Now, one of the real reasons this is important is because let's say I have a web server, then I have a series of VPN users that may log in, then I have a, a firewall. And with those different data sources, I want to be able to track when the user logged in, correlate that data against what they may have done on the web server, what changes they may have made, correlate that again with what they SSH'd into, and maybe look again at you know uh, timeframes and how frequently they log in and then build triggers off of that. This is also where firewall logs become really important when you have a system breach where you need to reverse engineer how they got there. And unfortunately, this is one of those uh, missing components that many companies that are breached have is they don't have a good logging system. They just have to run around from computer to computer looking at the logs of each one to try to really determine what happened. This is where something like Graylog can come in because it's not just be able, it's not just able to pull in Linux logs, by the way. We can go way further than Linux logs. It'll ingest actually a massive list of formats. Um, 
this is one of the things that we'll start with real quick is Jay's familiar with AWS. So among the inputs, as it referred to in Graylog, inputs are different ways to ingest the logs is AWS Cloud Trail, AWS Flow Logs, AWS Kinesis, AWS General Logs, Beats. Um, I'm not as familiar with CEF, AMQP, Kafka Logs, uh, TCP Logs, UDP Logs. <laughs> HTTP logs, uh, Gelf style logs, which isn't Gelf. That's an export for Apache, is it right? I'm not familiar. Yeah, um, it's. I, I was reading a little bit about it, like <laughs> um, pulling JSON paths from HTTP, NetFlow UDP data. Uh, there's a series of Palo Alto. So back to the enterprise stuff, like Palo Alto's uh, Network TCP Pan OS version logs, version eight and version nine. Um, Raw plain text logs uh, via TCP, and of course, syslog, you know, the usual, <laughs> the, the one that at least most yeah. things will export. And yes, there is a way to also ingest Windows logging from here. Um, that we won't get too much into that topic, but it, if you just Google real quick how to do it, they have uh, work instruction on how to get that going. Yeah, sounds great to me. I don't do a really good job with this. Um, so, so basically, you know, I think people roll their eyes when they find out how I do it. And, th and this is why I wanted to look at Greylock. I'm, I'm literally manually going from one server to another. So I'll SSH into server A, and then I'll go to PFSense and go to the diagnostic logs in the browser, have a terminal window on one side, uh, going to random servers and trying to correlate myself. That's a lot of work to do manually. So I don't want to do that manually anymore. And one of the interesting things I've done is uh, you can pipe in TrueNAS and your hypervisor, in my case, XCP and G, and then you can get two pieces of correlation data if you're having a problem with a virtual machine. And yep. this will allow you to look at what happened with the storage server and correlate it with a time slice of what was going on in a virtual machine. Like, hey, suddenly TrueNAS is under really high load. What caused that? Let's swing over to this. Oh. This virtual machine also is under high load at the same time. Oh, by the way, it has a storage target of that true NAS. So these are really helpful tools when you want to start troubleshooting. And I should have looked it up beforehand, but uh, the gray log, gray log extended log format is GELF, uh, but it's actually really popular. And some things that are uh, like Fluent D also has the ability to speak that. So there's a ton of large enterprise things that can ingest logs in this, which is kind of cool because learning this as a tool, you're going to find it's in use in the enterprise world as well. This is one of the things we like at the Home Lab show mm -hmm. is to bring you products that have that dual purpose. They're not just, oh, I'm using it, but I'll never see this in the real world. No, you're very likely to find this at a large yep. enterprise. Um, and we know some larger companies that I've talked to that are using this product and are pretty happy with it. I've actually talked to the team over at Graylog. Um, they're really cool. They got a cool community forum. But I guess we have to first start before you can get to any of these cool features is yep. installing Greylog. Now, until recently and, and, and recently being the last version that came out about a week ago, and that's when I found out apparently they're not doing the virtual machine updates yeah, anymore. We were just talking about that right before we went live. Yeah. Yeah, um, I didn't realize that they had stopped uh, doing that. So so basically, yeah. as as I understand it, from what Tom mentioned, they they offered uh, virtual machine images for various. Was it various um, hypervisors or just a generic? Image? They they were just supporting VirtualBox, but they gave it to you in OVA format. Um, th this allowed you to import a lot of different things, support the open virtualization architecture, so you can import them into a lot of different platforms. Um, it's you know, it, it's pretty easy though to install. Matter of fact, they they have installation for Ubuntu, Debian, CentOS. Uh, they also have Chef, Puppet, and Ansible, different playbooks and scripts uh, set up. They have a Docker, so you can build it in Docker. Uh, you can deploy this in Amazon Web Services. So it's actually part of AWS. We probably should have looked before the show. It may even be available inside of Linode as a as a system. If not, I'm sure we can even talk with Linode and see if they can do that. It, it's actually not. I, I just okay. looked. But you know, usually anytime someone mentions that, it, it has a way of happening because they have the stack scripts. So I saw someone. I, I think it was um, Gardner um, from the the um, one of my friends from YouTube that uh, created the Jitsi. Uh, version that they have up there that automatically installs that. So, um, I mean, anyone can do it and it'll probably happen now that we mentioned it. it just takes one person. Hey, I can do that. Yeah. And the fact that they've already put some Chef, Puppel, Chef Puppet, Ansible, and Docker together, one of yep. those tools will be used to help build an auto deployment in Linode. So I'm sure Linode's listening and we, we, we know some people. So, <laughs> yeah, we, we know people. <laughs> now, 
Installation overall, pretty easy. One of the problems in the logging world is if you've ever built your own elk and elastic stack and put it together, and don't get me wrong, those are cool products. And there's a component of those that gets entered in a gray log. I always feel like I set up a house of cards that I'm afraid to update because it'll break. That has been mm -hmm. a consistent problem of, because I know there's always the, what about these other open source tools? I, I don't think they're bad. I think they're a little bit more challenging to maintain. Graylog gives you kind of an ecosystem where I don't mind because they do offer, I built mine in Debian and you can load the Debian repositories on there. And I've had excellent luck with each of the updates doing exactly what I wanted it to do. It updated to the later version without destroying it. And uh, all it had to do is, you know, sometimes rebuild or make database changes based on changes that came down the stream. But that's the point. I'm not scared. I'm not in a panic attack to click apt-get update. <laughs> that's uh, yeah. one of the problems I that I've seen a few people complain about is, oh, the new version of this is out, but I know if I update it, things might break. Uh, they are using some Java and some Elastic in there but they're doing it in a way that they maintain so you don't have to worry about it. There are some uh, prerequisite warnings when you first set this up that if you run your own Elastic Stack instead of using the way they build it, uh, you can run into problems and you're kind of on your own. But they're pretty clear about that from the upgrade uh, right from the front. And their instructions are solid. Like you can go through absolutely step-by-step, -step, uh, copy paste out of their installation and it works. I've built this a couple times. Uh, there is some important points. And Jay asked me if there were some gotchas in the config. And there's at yeah. least one of them that is uh, definitely a, a silly problem. But it, it's, it'll, it'll get you because it'll create a lot of confusion. So once you set Graylog up and you start uh, setting up the inputs, one of the things that's cool is the inputs tell you the rate at which they're receiving logs. And this is part of the troubleshooting. So first is, you know, did you have the firewall port open to allow logs? And you build a series of inputs. So if your gray log, instead of being like a one spot with one port open to ingest all the logs, you can be very granular and you create an input for each server you want to ingest. Doing it this way gives you a lot more control. And we'll get to that later about why that's a good thing in the way they do the parsing. But the nice thing is just telling you how many kilobits of data is coming in is very helpful. So you'll get it set up. You set up your first input and you watch these kilobits of data come in, but then you go to the main dashboard and there's no data. Now, this is the gotcha in the config that you'll find a lot of posts on the forums about of it's taking data in. The indexes are getting bigger in the data sets, but there's no data being displayed. The mm -hmm. default dashboard displays to showing you data from the last five minutes. Why that's important is because the time zone is set in the config. If your log server is in Eastern Standard Time, like mine is, and you chose not to change it to Eastern Standard Time, it is very important that the log times line up or it's not putting them in the same time zone. It may be putting them in the future or in the past, depending on your time zone, but that creates a lot of confusion because you'll actually see all these logs coming in and the system index is getting bigger, but you're looking for maybe 10 minutes and you hit the pull down and go, show me what happened in the last hour. Well, if it's 12 hours out of sync with you, you have to go for a full 24 hours and then you'll start seeing the logs. And it just creates confusion because first you don't see the logs then you go, oh, they're there, but they're all the wrong time. Time zones matter a lot with logging systems. Uh, so it is important that you make sure that the time zone of the server is in your time zone. So that's uh, it's, it's a small gotcha, but boy, is it easily overlooked when you're setting up a demo server. You're like, ah, I'll set the time zone later. Yep. Don't yep. do that. <laughs> don't, don't do that. No, no. So, so are you referring to the time zone settings on the Linux server itself, or is there like a separate... It, both uh, Linux file. server and in the config files. When you walk through the config, it's very well labeled. Um, there is like a master server config for Graylog itself where you can set a ton of different parameters. Um, once you're doing this, though, the uh, that's where you got little things like time zone that you just need to set. It, I, I can't remember. I think it says to set the time zone, but it's it probably one of the easily skipped over things. And I, it, it had me stumped for longer than I almost want to admit <laughs> why, yeah. why my log server wasn't working properly. Now, multiple server setup. If you plan to have multiple servers taking care of different roles in your cluster, um, you need to modify a few things covered in the multi-node setup guide. Goes out of scope of this and probably not needed for your home lab, but I seen a question fly by in the chat. What if, you know, gray logs unavailable for an update? You can build multi-node large-scale server systems and cluster them together. Gray node scales to 
large company size for enterprise log ingestion. So uh, it's important to note if you want to build a scalable system, they even have an instruction for doing that, probably out of scope of your home lab and what's needed. But nonetheless, yes, you can do that. Yes, there are ways for, you know, getting that working. Now, a few of the components it runs on. I mentioned Java. It also mm -hmm. uses MongoDB, but don't panic. It uses MongoDB for some of the settings. It's not the main database where everything is kept. Um, and the Elasticsearch. Graylog can be used with Elasticsearch 7.x. Follow the instructions that they have inside there to get that set up. But the Elasticsearch system is specifically uh, reined in as, as you will. It doesn't quite use their query language natively. They have their own, but it's pretty intuitive uh, when you get to the logging and the queries on there. So it, that is a prerequisite that you have on there. And of course, then you have the gray log engine itself. Resource intensiveness, um, that can be a little bit of something to think about. Uh, it depends on how much of the logs you're ingesting will ger generally determine how much resources you have to this. So I wanna give an example of what I'm running here at the office. And currently we have about 53 gigs of data uh, stored in there, which is, is parsing all my firewall logs from PFSense, which makes up the majority of it. And I get roughly, let me change it to uh, one hour so I can get you, I'll tell you in real time how many logs are being ingested on there. I get about 4,000 data points per minute. And that's mostly coming from PFSense. Actually, 90% of that comes from PFSense where I have it logging all the firewall logs. And even with a system like this, it's using about four and a half or five gigs worth of uh, memory to run. So if you start ingesting a lot of logs, you're gonna have to scale the system accordingly. So if you look at it from that, and that standpoint, like, you know, ingesting firewall logs, yes, you're gonna need to have a beefier server if you wanna run this to monitor your web servers, depending on how busy they are and depending on how many hits those particular servers get, you'll end up with you know, a much, much smaller scale. Um, I also have my Unify system is piped into here as well. So Unify produces very, very small. I have 30 days of retention with all my Unify logs, which is all my switches and everything else, only accounts for about 600 megs of data over 30 days versus the 45 gigs that PFSense produces every 30 days. So scaling on the server, you're gonna have to kind of take a look at what you're ingesting and how you're parsing it. And you can set per server limits on how much data you take in. Maybe for things like a, uh, TrueNAS server and your virtualization server, seven days of logs may be all you need because you're usually dealing with problems kind of more real time uh, than going back. But of course, uh, if you work in the corporate inter inter enterprise world, absolutely, you're going to have to kind of figure out uh, what those retention policies are. Sometimes policies, like where my friend works at a large cybersecurity company, six months. They have petabyte servers that store logs because they have six month policy retention across 160,000 devices. <laughs> wow. Yeah. He says that he says they have just a, they, he says they have just big data arrays that are just storage for logs. This is like when the solar winds incident happened, I asked him if he was able to parse that. He goes, we were able to answer the question for the last six months where we in the solar winds incident involved in any way because they could reverse look up an IP address for six months that any server had talked to. I'm like, wow, they, uh, they spend a lot of money on that. And it's, this is why it's kind of an important aspect when you get to the corporate scale. And I'm, trust me, the majority of companies you talk to will not have that answer. They're like, we're able to keep seven days worth of logs. <laughs> yeah, you know, what's weird is that some companies don't even know what their retention requirements are. Like, like, let that sink in for a minute. Like, you, you, like, if I was working with a client and I, and I, and, you know, they want to set up a server like this, they would probably ask, you know, or I would ask them how long to keep the logs for. And it's surprising how few people in the company know their own requirements, and they have to go find the person that wrote the policy and knows where the policy is. So, um, if you are going to roll it out to a, a company, you should at least know the, you know, what what the requirements are there. But the value for home lab people. We don't have legal requirements as far as I've ever been made aware of. So we can have one day, two days, three days, three months, whatever we feel like. Yeah. And if you can afford more, great. And but right away, you'll, you'll run into the problem. Even that somewhat I do is balancing out. You know, I keep 30 days. I've thought about extending a little further, but I'm going to have to up the resources I have dedicated, specifically the storage uh, to that server. Now, one thing this is where there's a little bit of a gotcha is 
active data versus archive data. That is a paid feature of Graylog. And one of those things that is kind of an upsell for the product, if you would like to archive data off of there and using it in archive is nice because it essentially goes uh, static. It's not part of the active database, but can be queried as needed and brought back in. That is one of the paid features that they offer uh, if you want to buy the commercial version. I'll just mention that out there as people may say, well, can't you just keep putting it somewhere, like compress it and stack it over here? That is one of the, so to speak, upsell features of it. A um, little, little bit of a balancing act, figuring out how much you actually need, but that is an option for people that use the enterprise version. Now, let's dive into log ingestion. As I mentioned, there's lots of different formats out there. So you'll have to make a determination of which one works for you. But we'll just say Sysmon because that's your, your standard or Syslog. Uh, your standard Syslogs are what you're going to find. Most everything has an output for the Unify system, the TrueNAS system, all well, your Linux and BSD based systems generally have no problem sending that data out. You also can pipe specific types of logs like things out of Apache on there. From there, they have the filtering system that brings them in. And that's where it gets pretty neat because you build these and I have them shared on my GitHub. Uh, and so th there's a lot of them in the forum. They have a marketplace of free extractors. Extractor is the word they use. So as the data comes in, the extractors take unstructured data because data structures are, although similar, maybe not be the same across each device that you import. So you have an extractor that will line all the fields up. Now, if you ingest unstructured data in randomness, no problem. It actually has a way to parse that even in their search system, but it's way better when you assign field names to it. That way you can search by field name, whether that be IP address or uh, the way it labels drives or any of the other type of data you're in there. The extractor takes the data and uses regex. Uh, it can be done with other ways too, but regex is the most popular way to do it. And you just define all the field, like in this position, because it's a lot of times just comma delimited, depending on how it's uh, brought in or space delimited. You say, based on this marker, this separator, put it into this category. This is really handy, especially with firewall logs, because it tells me the filter rule that that firewall log was being processed. It tells me the inbound IP address, the outbound IP address, the NAT rule, if there was one, it'll tell me what the outside port was and what the inside port was. So for example, in firewall rules, once the extractor parses all these, I can start filtering in the dashboard for certain IP addresses, find me this public IP, then pivot and say, show me everybody internally, the internal IPs that ever talk to this external IP address. This is why the structured data uh, becomes so important on there for when you're doing these extractors. And the extractors, are, they're done I, I almost use the word plain English, but uh, that depends whether or not you speak regex. <laughs> so they are human parsable, humans created them. Uh, they can be a bit tricky, but what I did myself, and I covered this because I have a full tutorial on Greylog as well, is taking these extractors and I, I just downloaded somebody else's and modified what didn't work to add the extra field for what did work for what I needed. Uh, so it's not it's daunting at first, depending on where your skill set is with regex. I I wish I was better at regex. I, I need to just like sit down, grab a book and uh, make a weekend of it and beat it back into myself. I think Jay's probably a lot better at it than me. I, I wouldn't make that assumption if I were you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, I need to do exactly the same thing, actually. Yeah. If not, we we will um, we'll have to call our friend whose license plate is said awk. <laughs> <laughs> I don't I know if you know that. I, that Bill's yeah, license I didn't plate. know this person. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, that's Phil's license plate. Uh, what our friend I think thinks in regex, man. Oh. I've seen that. Yeah, he, I never knew he had that license plate. Interesting. Yes, I love that license plate. So, <laughs> not that. And before someone says, "Hey, you're giving away details about him," it's there's pictures of it online already. So he's. I mean, you don't get that license plate and not brag about it. So. <laughs> yep. All right. Next thing is streams. This is kind of where I, I have in my video a breakdown. I wish, in matter of fact, I've actually talked to Graylog and says, can you guys build a chart of this? And I built one for my video. Basically, it's a flow chart to talk about how the data comes in. So first you create an input, you ingest the logs, you run it through the extractor to create a formatted data. Then you create the streams. Now, the stream is one more intermediary step that has alerts and rules that 
break down the data. Now, the alerts and rules are important because there's a lot of data coming in and you don't necessarily want to trigger on anything. So you want to make sure when you're building these, like, okay, where does this data go? Where should it land? And it can land in more than one spot. So you create a series of indexes for this to land on. So each one of these different indexes or sections of the database, essentially, one for PFSense, one for Unify, one for each one of your servers, you can put them all in one it, it just trust me way easier because your retention policies are set on a per index. You then want each stream to stream to that index with perhaps different rule sets. Um, and that rule set, like I said, can be removing some of the extraneous data that you know is not important. Because sometimes with servers, when you're sending out syslog data, it just sends it all. And that may not be the best thing for you to send all the data. This is where you can get a little bit more fine grain. And you can also say, look, I only need seven days of this data. I don't even care about it after seven days. It's not real relevant. Or maybe even parse out things that are not important because there's all kinds of noise or just notice level data. I mean, ideally you go to the log server or whatever, setting the logs and turn notice data down. But I live in a real world where that isn't always possible. <laughs> and some servers, uh, Unify can be one of them. It creates a pretty decent amount of logs that are not always really helpful. Um, so you just kind of say are, either you keep them or you don't, but you can, that's what these streams are for is to kind of narrow that part down. Um, but I have found it really helpful because uh, what happens behind the scenes when your Wi-Fi is working, there's a good example of this, as you roam between devices and as things move around the network, there actually is a lot of handshake logs. There's the whole process of passing off uh, testing the RSSI or whatever parameters you have in your Wi-Fi and saying, does this device go over here? Does this device go over there? And actually I found the log system to be very useful in that because we, we ran into a weird handshaking problem where devices wouldn't roam and it was helpful to figure out what devices would give the error and what that error was and not have that lost in time, especially because when you can see when it happens frequently over a few days, it, it can be very helpful. But it also is a lot of logging data uh, to be able to trust that. And it helped us uh, determine, I think, I can't remember if Wendell mentioned it on the show or before the show when we had him on. Remember how we saw about MAC addresses changing mid-flight? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I do remember that. Yeah. This is one of the things we were able to uh, look for was we could see the IP address not changing, but the MAC address changing in the data set. And we're like, that's not supposed to happen. Uh, <laughs> it didn't get reassigned, but that led to understanding why the handshake wasn't working. These are some of those little extraneous things that you start getting out of there. Now, let's talk about the alert system. I'm not the best at setting this up. They do have good documentation on it, but alerts are those trigger points. And this can lead further into something I haven't done yet, but I'm going to be working with their team uh, that they've done a lot of tighter integration with. You can build series of alerts. Those alerts can be based on things like, all right, this many logs, a log related to a specific system, or just a quantity of logs. So you can set either, you know, you parse it for a certain word, a certain set of words, or a triggered event because there's too many logs. Suddenly someone's trying to log in with OpenVPN. Someone tried more than three times with a password. Okay, now we have a trigger, an actual event, and then you can have it set to alert you. Where this goes a step further and where Greylog's extending capability, and if you go on their site, they talk about being essentially like a SIM tool, so a security and events monitoring. The ability they give you is to pull in other data, and let's say you have a list of known bad IP addresses or active threats. Um, and for those of you who ever want to dive into what active threat looks like, uh, the free version of uh, the free online account you can get with Alien Vault is a great way to look up active threats. You can start pulling data like that in there. And what Alien Vault does, it'll create correlation data with free feeds that say these IP addresses are known command and control servers for some particular threat. Of course, you would love to know if a server in your office is talking to one of those command and control servers because that means something bad is about to happen. These are what we refer to in the security world as indicators of compromise. Well, these are also things that there is the ability to, and granted, I'm speaking from something I have not built yet inside of Greylog, but this is something I'm really looking at doing, of Greylog going a step further, pulling in threat feeds and lists of IP addresses, and then alerting you if it finds that one of your systems has decided to start talking to those IP addresses. This is why I find it so important to have things like your firewall logs being ingested in there because that gives you that piece of data that you're looking for to go, all right, you know, this is going in there and all of a sudden, I don't know why, but it's, he started talking to this command and control server. And 
what you want historically is how long has it been talking so you can try to determine when it happened because when it reaches one of those threat intelligence feeds like the one i mentioned with alien vault when that's when alien vault found out about it that doesn't mean it when it started to exist it, you want to know when that uh when something started talking to it that gives you a better idea of what happened on that day and this is where going back historically is extremely helpful when you have these being able to put these in and this goes back to the first part of the conversation about importing structured data so if you know the ip address you can type in in, in the field for search in the dashboard ip equals this then show me over this amount of time and now you're drilling down to well the alien vault feed triggered on tuesday but it was last Tuesday when this device started talking to it and you can start, you know, uh, running around like a mad person and locking everything down, figuring out what they had resources and access to hopefully before uh, you become a cybersecurity incident. Because that's that's it's funny how a lot of this is very reactionary in the security world um, It's when we find these command and control servers that we have to start reversing it. But unfortunately, many of them are found as things get detonated and. Uh, as as the command and control servers are sending out all their uh, things, that's when often we learn about them. So hopefully you can catch it before all of that. But it does have that full alert system in there built in for doing that. Um, and like I said, there's actually a lot of trigger alerts where you can look for system load information and things like that. Anything you can parse out of there and then build alerts on um, can be very helpful. And this is especially if you're looking for weird attacks on your web servers, if you're ingesting all your web server logs, this is that same thing. Create triggers for when someone keeps trying really hard on the admin page or some function on there. Uh, you can put that data in there and now you have a way to go and reverse what's going on. Uh, one of the things I, I see a lot of in my logs is WordPress attacks against my non WordPress web servers, uh, which is just kind of fun to watch, but you can alert for certain types of attacks you may see against a WordPress system, um, especially like uh, the shell escapes. I see a lot of those backslash, 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 root, backslash, etc, backslash, uh, pata, um, etc, shadow and things like that. You'll see them and you're like, why are they escaping it? And it also becomes, if you start Google searching it, great ways to learn about how people attack web servers. <laughs> a really good point. Yeah. What do you think, Jay, about running this in, in, in Linode? You could probably gain some insight if you started piping all the data you have on your Linode servers. Yeah, I think I'm going to. I'm, I'm setting it up locally and probably another one in Linode. I'm going to try to split them and then kind of see where it goes. I'm actually running it or installing it right now, as a matter of fact. So I think there's some, con I don't want to say concerns or just, I should say questions, because I don't know if this is an issue with Greylog, and maybe you'll know the answer. Um, have you seen situations where logging itself becomes a network problem because of all the data being thrown across the wire from all the servers all going to this one? So you, you have a lot of uh, traffic there if you don't really, um, I think it might have been Elk Stack. I'm trying to remember where if you don't kind of set some limits, then it could actually cause IO issues. Is that something yeah. you can take into consideration? It is, it is worth considering. Um, as you scale up the data, the server has to process and index it. That's a database function. That means it's got some processor usage going on and a lot of hard drive access going on. And this is where, let's say I'm watching a virtualization server because I am. And let's say that virtualization server is also running gray log. And I'm suddenly producing a lot of logs because my virtualization server is at a stall for something else. Now, Greylog just got a massive amount of logs, which is going to churn up the hard drive uh, and create that. So there is that ampl amplification. Um, as far as bandwidth goes, logs are generally, because they're plain text, not huge. You're not sending actual data. You're just saying the plain text. Uh, it's but it's something to note. The other thing to note is that you should probably have your logs as much as possible secured and locked down on a separate management network. Uh, obviously passing, some of the logs do pass in plain text. They don't always pass securely. Nature of a lot of devices, they don't have a secure because uh, syslog is just, it's an old protocol sent on mm -hmm. open ports essentially. So just kind of be aware that the systems will have problems. Um, of slight note, when you're setting up Greylog, and I probably should have mentioned this at the beginning, but it's still 
when I say low port number for syslog, you should ingest on a higher port number. There's a little warning that pops up to remind you, uh, but gray log does not run as root. They did a, when you, you, if you've gone through the instructions, Dave may have noticed it actually sets up, uh, I believe a gray log user for uh, management. This helps, you know, mitigate if there was a flaw in gray log, privilege escalation as much as they can. Um, but that being important, that also means you want to open up ports above 1024 for ingestion. So even though your syslog server, most of them are low, I think it's 514, I think is syslog off the top of my head. Um, when you're setting up ports to open on your Graylog server, you're generally choosing higher port numbers because it's in the user space because Graylog's running as its own user on the system. Um, they did structure the back end of it that way. But these are also things. Um, as he someone mentioned in the comments, you can pass uh, Graylog logs via TLS. Graylog absolutely accepts encrypted log formats. It's whether or not what you're ingesting from has that option to do it. That's it's it's less a problem with Graylog and more a problem on the other end of what you're sending. And unfortunately, if you're you know especially printers and things like that, maybe you want a bunch of printer logs in there, and this could be important uh, if you're dealing with, you know, an enterprise environment, I'm sorry, those printers, we're lucky if we can get them support any type of secure protocol. We're just happy if the printers don't have Telnet enabled in 2021. We're, we're, we got a, we got a really low bar here, uh, but printer logs could be something else that you want to look at and ingest them all and consolidate all your printers into one place. And that's going to be a, a use case, which I really, <laughs> I would be amazed if printers sent things over TLS. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would too. Printers are like the bane of the IT person's existence. Like every company I've ever worked for during every stage of my career from entry level all the way up to administrator and beyond, printers and print servers have always been a nightmare to deal with. Yeah. Uh, and someone pointed out, uh, someone did point out a valid point of you could always do uh, traffic shaping and set these at a lower traffic priority on the network if, if the traffic part was a uh, concern. You know, generally networks are, uh, with exceptions, of course, if you're, especially if this is working remotely, uh, locally, you're going to have plenty of bandwidth. But there, the restrictions really start to come in is if I wanted to ingest logs from the web. Now, first, if I'm going to ingest them from the web back to my office here locally, in that circumstance, I'm really not going to want to do it via you know, something that's done in clear text for one, uh, you may want to do that best ideas over a VPN. But of course, now you're talking about real restrictions of how much bandwidth do you have and can allocate to it. But once again, it is it, I look at if you're building something like a modern web server, you're going to tune your Apache logs or Nginx logs or HA proxy system to only really send you the data that's relevant. And because those are modern systems that you can modify how the logs work. So you can fine tune it properly to get the right logging information, the actionable one, not all the noise. I mean, maybe you need to know all the requests or maybe you don't need to know every line item request of everything someone hit. You want to know the connection they made, was it successful, certain transactions. You maybe want to know if the database re reaches certain load levels, and but you don't need to know every query. If you start sending every query down the pipe, you're going to create your own problems. <laughs> Yep, totally agree. So what's your opinion on storage? Somebody asked about that in the um, live chat. So we have a couple different places we can put Graylog. We can install it, obviously, yep. on the Linux server, or we can, you know, locally or on Linode. But when it comes to the storage, I mean, already I'm thinking LVM for sure. If you're going to use uh, block storage, you should always use LVM. You can expand yeah. it live. But beyond that, uh, what are your opinions based on what you've seen when it comes to where um, it's best to store it? And also whether NFS is a good idea or a bad idea? Um, you know, be because you're building on a standard Linux platform, they do have document and gray log where it saves its data. So you, and this is just good uh, hygiene of when you're building a virtual machine, build a virtual machine and then create a mount where it mounts a data store. Maybe that data store, either via NFS, SMB, however you want to mount it within that machine and then mount it over or even ice because there's plenty of options here. That way you're separating the operating system drive essentially or where the operating system is stored and where the data is stored because it, especially if you, you you thinking maybe you're going to ingest a lot of logs, something like a, you know, a share over, and you know, in NFS will work you, if you properly set that up. Uh, what was the other one you used? Is it SSHFS? I do use SSHFS, but there's going to be some overhead there. I'm a huge fan of um, AutoFS. 
Um, for that. example, yeah, well, that's with Plex. And all it is is just an overlay on top of whatever you're using. You could use it with SSHFS, Samba, um, NFS, whatever. And, you know, with NFS, you deal with locking issues sometimes and other miscellaneous challenges with NFS. I mean, it's an old technology. Yeah. It hasn't really aged all that well, but it works fine. But with AutoFS, the, um, it's not mounted until something tries to access it. So in the case of Plex, I have the movies on um, TrueNAS, and they're shared via NFS. The VM is like a 16 gigabyte VM. It's teensy. So if I was to LS the directory where the video files are supposed to be mounted, or Plex goes to check or scan the movie directory, AutoFS intervenes and says, oh, yeah, you, you're trying to check this directory. Well, let me go ahead and mount that for you. And it's so quick at doing that, that Plex, for example, won't even ever know that it was never or ever not mounted in the first place. So when you go to reboot it and everything, it times out after a few minutes if nothing accesses it. It just doesn't eliminate locking issues or other NFS challenges, but it makes it a heck of a lot easier to deal with. So already I'm thinking container, AutoFS, NFS, um, a container could be Docker or a container in Proxmox, a LexC container, for example. Um, those are some of the thoughts that I have off the top of my head with how to roll it out. Yeah. And even when you spin things up, um, it, it's about thinking about where the data part is stored. That's the big part. It's like the, the operating itself in Graylog is not a huge product, but the results, the indexes that are being stored, that's the part. And when you break down and go through instructions, you'll see where it's putting those. And you should consider putting that on its own mount that is somewhere with expandable storage. Uh, this is one of those problems where people say, well, man, I need to expand my VM. I'm not sure how to do it. That's where you've added some complexity. If you just take the mount where the data is stored, because honestly, the VM from when I went from version four to version 4.1, Graylog did not get substantially bigger. But the retention policies are absolutely driving the size of that data and the data sets are separate from the functional application running. So just it's just general good design to separate those two out and having mm -hmm. it, you know, on something like a TrueNAS system where, hey, if you ever upgrade your TrueNAS system, just point it right back at the NFS share. Make sure you copy all the files from the old system to the new system and magic. We have more availability for uh, that storage. And because it's a database application, this is where we can go way off topic if we wanted and dive into storage design on something like TrueNAS and building the most optimized uh, data set for a database, which would mean setting lower block sizes usually because of the way the write commits work and uh, storage optimization. By the way, if you just search my channel for you know how to set up ZFS, I've actually dove into this topic and I highly recommend uh, checking out Level 1 Tech's uh, Wendell, who was on the show a couple weeks ago. He's dove into this topic as well for optimizing yeah. ZFS. Um, it, when you're dealing with database applications with lots of transactions, this is a popular use case for why you don't wanna run this a inside your VM, you know, at scale, home lab people, I don't think you're gonna have a problem, but if you are right. thinking about how to scale this up, it's a good skill to learn uh, to have that run separate. It also makes it easier to back yeah. up because backing up a uh, virtual machine that's 50 plus gigs is harder than backing up a you know couple gigs of virtual machine and deciding how you want to back up the data. Now you could back up the data, of course, once you have it on something like TrueNAS or a ZFS system with ZFS replication, once again, making your life easier. One one thing I'm thinking about, and I'm I'm, not, I'm I'm going to try hard not to make this a storage discussion because that's a bottomless pit of a rabbit hole. But <laughs> um, I mean, I think we could probably simplify it if you agree to. You need something reasonably fast, or if you have multiple solutions and one is faster than the other, I, I would assume you want to choose a faster one. So, for example, my TrueNAS server is all spinning Rust, and even if I was to implement 10 gig, which you know, spoiler alert, Tom and I will be working on yep. that. Um, <laughs> But before I get to that point, my local Proxmox server has um, M an M2 SSD as its local storage, and it's a really good one too. So I would assume that a local um, you know, storage device on the Proxmox server directly would probably um, outperform um, the you know, 10 gig to a true NAS unless it's splitting the writes across a bunch of disks. So you know, keep in mind, uh, you know, whatever you have, that's faster. Yeah. So that's in, this is just an overall application design. Um, yeah. As I've had people ask me about XCP and G2, why does it only store files as big? I'm like, if you're storing files bigger than that, you should be putting them on a storage server, not keep creating more VMs at some point. Um, so the last little piece I want to cover, though, with Graylog is, yes, it has a dashboard that allows you 
the pretty stuff and uh the the it'll let you create some charts it'll create pie charts it'll create that uh, i didn't want to dive too much into it because this is a podcast so i'm not going to get all the visual on you uh, mm -hmm. but trust me check out their website they have the ability to do that i'm not the biggest chart lover but i will tell you if you ever have to sell something to a management they love charts <laughs> and so yes there is the ability to put this together they have some instructions on it um you can create you know uh, distribution charts so you can understand things and look at things over time with graphs. I, I think they, they do have their place. Um, I People get really excited about them, but at least that ability is there. And because this is all open source, you're able to access this. So if you wanted to set a few people comment and it's not something I've tried at all, but when I did the gray log video, a lot of people said they loaded things in addition to gray log uh, on top of gray log so they could access that data with something that produced even cooler looking charts. And I said, oh, cool. Um, I mean, all the data is just stored in databases on an open source system. So you're able to pull that data back out and massage it in some other way and make it as pretty as you want. That's a part of the yeah. beauty of having an open source platform for all of this. <laughs> I, I agree. I'm not really a graph person either because I don't want to be that kind of um, IT manager, but um, there is one thing I really do like about graphs and that's seeing trends, which can be helpful. Yes. So if you're looking at your disc and it's not, you know, maybe it's 40% full, but every week it's gaining an additional one or 2%, you could try to predict at what point you're gonna have to take action before it's like alerting that it's 80%, 90%. And then your CPU, if you, um, you know, your server is getting more popular or maybe you're hammering it more, you, you'll see the CPU kind of, you know, slowly over time, it's it's baseline usage is going to get up there um, gradually over time. So it just kind of gives you an idea, like when you might have to add another core, if it's a VM or up, up the storage. So um, that way it's not like, oh, I got to deal with this right now because it decided to alert just a few minutes ago. Mm -hmm. um, something I probably should mention, speaking of alerts, the inversion of an alert is true and you're able to do this. What I mean by that is, a system, um, just because the system isn't sending logs doesn't mean there's a problem. Matter of fact, that can be the indicator of a problem. That system just quit sending me data. Oh, I'm sure it's fine. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a good point. I mean, if it's not sending something, it's like sometimes you have to watch the watcher and, oh, yeah, everything's fine because I'm not getting alerts. Yeah, you're also yeah. not getting data either. Um, and that's not a uh, something surprisingly that a lot of people, they don't, really, um, they don't really pay attention to the baseline of what is being used all the time. And I, I had a client one time reach out, like my server is always 50 or 60% utilized for the CPU. I'm like, awesome. Then that means it's doing a job and it has a purpose. Yeah. What do you mean? I need to get that down. No, it's doing work. Let's let it work. Let's let it do its job. Just like with the, the logging, it's going to have a baseline too. So um, just if it drops off, like just like load average drops to zero on a server, that's probably not a good idea. Logs actually drop to zero. That's even worse. Yeah. And one of the problems you can run into, especially if you're talking about trend charts, if you're watching a hard drive fill up, once a system, and especially Linux systems, once they reach that we're full point, um, sometimes they'll stop services and stop sending out data because it can't write the logs that it's trying to send. So that can also be an indicator that like, yeah, it just stopped logging because it had no room, which then failed the ser the syslog server, which means it quit sending data out because it didn't have anywhere to write it locally either. And uh, chaos ensues. <laughs> I think what I'm hearing here is people need to check out your Greylog video and also your Zabbix video. So with the Zabbix, yeah. we can alert about disk the disk being full. So you don't have to discover that on, you know, just because it stopped working. And then, of course, um, you know, I don't think it was that long ago that you did the gray log video, right? It was no, like, it's just a couple months ago. The gray log one's pretty recent. Yeah. I covered gray log four. Uh, four point one is just a minor, obviously, just minor release, so it's not dramatically different uh, in terms mm -hmm. of the install base. Um, they mostly just added. It, it's kind of cool. They it's a bunch of small enhancements. I've actually survived several version upgrades uh, since then. They had a couple big updates to the four. Um, the feature updates really came in the four point one, but uh, it's updated perfectly fine. But there's not anything. Uh, major that's changed that would change that video around. Eventually, I will do a 4.1 video because they did, they updated the interface to make it, I think, a little bit more intuitive to use. Uh, one of the nice things is it's got a really nice autofill feature. So when you're typing, it's not like you have to understand everything. They have a little side um, list that comes up and it reminds me of, you know, some of your, uh, like a, like a, IDE environment where you start typing, it can auto complete certain fields because it goes, 
oh yeah, this field is related to you're asking for IP address, you're asking for an event ID and start parsing it. And one of the things it does immediately visually now, um, it gives you really cool bars. That's one of the reasons I just clicked over on my dashboard to tell you how many logs I'm ingesting per minute. Um, if I, as soon as you just stretch it to all logs, it'll tell you how many logs came in per minute for that log or per second. Um, those little breakdowns are all in little sliders that I, I like that little intuitiveness to start understanding it. So it's instantly, even just while you're searching, giving you some of that trending information that you're looking for. Awesome. Well, we will leave links to all this, uh, their documentation, like I said, which is thorough. They have all kinds of resources and community forums and all kinds of extractors for a wide range of devices, not just uh, the ones we mentioned, but uh, everything from Cisco equipment to you name the enterprise piece of equipment. There's uh, log ingestion and extractor tools. They uh, Quite, quite a bit there. And of course, all your usual things like Apache servers and stuff like that. So whether it be a hardware, physical piece of equipment or some of the software servers, uh, they have it. They do have an instruction on how to get uh, logs out of Windows. Windows logging is um, its own animal. And yeah. <laughs> I, it, it, Microsoft's event system is just not good. Even if you have the information, I wish that's, a, if there was an improvement I would be excited about from them, it would be that. But yes, it can ingest some of the less than wonderful logs where things fail successfully in windows <laughs> i will say as, an, as a completely unrelated aside um a lot, what a lot of people don't realize is that windows logs are amazing well and the reason why i feel like that is because if you're buying a used computer from someone on facebook marketplace or whatever oh, that. Yeah. you just go right into the logs and view the you know war the warnings and the the critical logs under system logs, and if there's memory issues, the disk is about to fail or something, you'll find out, and then you'll know they shouldn't buy that computer. So yeah, there's that too. Yeah. There's, it's 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 a mixed bag for what Windows does and doesn't log, and yeah, right. it's a, it's probably a different topic. I don't know if it's one we'll dive into on the Home no. Lab show in the future or not, but I'm I'm, <sighs> not we'll steer like we'll steer clear of that. But thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, and for those of you watching the live show, yes, this will be published as a podcast very soon. Um, this episode will be probably available within the next 24 hours. So if you want to listen to it again, uh, check out all the show notes, check out our sponsor, Linode, and thank you. Thank you very much.